Welcome back to Bomber's Workshop, and thanks so much for joining me here once again. It is always nice to have you back. This time, I need to thank you also for your patience. Uh, I think it's been about four or five months since I turned out part one of this, the Toyota High Clearance Rear Bumper Build. Uh, but finally, I'm back with part two, and I appreciate uh, you coming back and checking it out again. Uh, I promised that I'd do this in two parts, and I indeed have done that. Uh, and that's probably part of why it took me so long to turn this one out. Uh, this video is almost an hour long. It's the longest one I've ever produced. Uh, it includes a whole bunch of tips and tricks um, as in terms of uh, fabrication generally and of course also some stuff applied specifically to the Toyota high clearance rear bumper so without further ado let's get started and finish this bumper up back on the truck and I'm really really happy with the fit up of this side the passenger side of the vehicle fits beautifully really nice clean line along the, um, the bottom of the, the truck bed there it does sit a little further back on this side than the uh, driver's side. I don't know if you can see that very well with this lighting, but uh, the reason for that is because of the damage here to the vehicle, the whole box side has been pushed forward slightly. So that's why you see that bit of a step there, about a one inch discrepancy compared to when we come over to this side. That one lines up much better. There is a little step, but there'll be a front plate applied to this yet, which will bring it out about a quarter of an inch yet. So it'll be almost perfectly lined up on this side. The other side will be Maybe not an inch, maybe three quarters of an inch out. But I'm not uh, repairing the collision damage. We're just, uh, we're just masking it over as best we can with this high, high clearance bumper. So it's going to do. But anyway, that side worked out beautifully. This side is the side I haven't welded up completely yet. Or in fact, I haven't welded the other side completely yet either, but a lot more. But this one you can see tails down as it goes towards the front of the vehicle. So I want to bring this end of the bumper up by yeah, about 3 eighths of an inch, 7 sixteenths of an inch. Uh, so I'm going to have to cut a couple of my tacks back here, cut the uh, tack that you can see the heat uh, penetration there from, uh, which is the support that goes between the, um, the frame mount and the uh, bumper side. Cut that as well, and then I'll make my slight adjustments, tack it all back together, and then I'll probably remove it from the vehicle and brace it up and weld it. But before I do that, I made myself a note to trim for clearance and uh, let me grab a light. So it could be that part of my issue is that I'm actually contacting the body there. If you see just right in that area, I haven't trimmed it back quite as much as I should. So I'm going to trim that in that way a little bit before we go down and that's going to give me a bit more clearance. What I may find is that once I do that, the bumper wants to sit a little higher on this end. It may be actually getting pushed down by the body at that point, but I kind of doubt it. Um, Anyway, we'll trim that and, um, and then probably replace the bumper. And then I'll cut those uh, tack welds like I just mentioned and kind of make the adjustment to the bumper itself once I'm totally confident that there isn't interference with the body. And there we are, back on the truck with the stand removed. And if we take a close look, you can see that that is a nice clean line just like the other side now. So we're getting well on our way now. If we look over here, this hub is nice and complete. This side, again, looks just like the other side in terms of the way that it fits up to the box side. So I'm very happy with it. Let's take it off and weld it up. All right, I have braced the bumper and it is weld up time. So let's just go over the bracing. Um, I went pretty extensive with it. I've braced down here to prevent any shrinkage in this plane. I've done a great big five inch uh, wide segment in there that I've tacked at the bottom and at the top. So you can see that here, that that gives me a nice brace all the way along there. It's such a long weld here that I wanted to make sure it was really well supported so I can cut that piece out afterwards. Um, I've added the brace in between the uh, frame mounts, similar bracing over in this corner and a similar idea here, only I used four inch wide steel instead of five because I just happened to have the right size piece kicking around. And then, of course, on the ends here as well, I've braced it right from end to end. So that hopefully will prevent any warpage from happening. I'm also going to take that stand right there and put it underneath the uh, this central bar, this bar in the center, I should say, um, and just put a, take a little bit of the weight off of there so that it's not so that it doesn't have weight hanging on it while I weld it to try to get it as neutral as it can possibly be. 
But uh, I'm going to weld this whole thing up now, and then uh, we'll pull the bracing off and see if we are left with any warpage. I desperately hope that we are not. Uh, I would film the weld up, but my UV filter for my camera is broken, so I'm just not able to do that. But look forward to welding clips in future videos. It's the next morning, and I did a bunch of welding before I left yesterday, and I've got a little bit more to do today. So you can see I've gone over virtually all of the seams. I haven't welded the uh, top plate to the bumper yet, but I've pretty well done the rest of this. You can see that I've got a couple spots still to do along here. When I do a long uh, weld like this, I do it in usually about two inch segments like you see here. Um, and then I let them cool to the point that I can lay my hand against it without uh, any pain at all um, before I move on. That's kind of what I use to, to figure out um, when I'm cool enough to start laying some more bead down. Uh, and that way I avoid most of my warping. And of course, as discussed, we brace everything really, really, really heavily as well to make sure that it doesn't warp. But um, this uh, gap here was just a little skinny and that's why you can see, or maybe you can see that I've opened that up with a zip disc. Uh, and that's the trick for that. If you don't, if you have a really thin gap there and you just weld over that, when you sand it down and blend it out to make it look really smooth, you'll wind up with a very thin little crack, which obviously you don't want. Um, so it's always best to give yourself that bit of weld prep with a zip disc if you, if you need to. Uh, over on the other side, we've got a lot of this done as well. A few spots yet to do, um, but uh, we're getting close. As you can see, I have turned the bumper over and I finished all of my welds along the, uh, the mounts here. Went down the back side of the bumper as well. I will probably eventually do along the top plate once I'm confident to leave the top plate. I might, I might not. Maybe I'll just do kind of a one inch stitch. It doesn't need to be tied in that much, but the more you weld it, the less vibration you're gonna get out of it. This side, of course, is the same. And there's the corner for the spindle to be received into. So it's all looking pretty clean and pretty finished up. Now it's uh, cool enough to remove all these braces. So I'm gonna do that and then we'll flip it over again, put it back on the truck, see what we got. I've removed all the bracing and uh, I noticed just a small amount of heat shrink or uh, change in dimensions thanks to heat. Uh, these tips suck together by about 3 16ths of an inch overall. So 3 30 seconds per side, uh, just under an eighth of an inch. And um, I don't think that's gonna be a big deal. Uh, in fact, when I undid the uh, brace between the frame mounts, they sprung out very slightly. So that might have negated what happened uh, at the tips here. I'm really not sure until I get it on the vehicle, but uh, I don't have a lot of fear. Uh, if you see big changes when you take your bracing off, then obviously you need to be worried because uh, your dimensions will not be the same as they were. <clears throat> but I think I'm pretty close, but we'll, we'll double check it on the vehicle. Now I'll go ahead and just sand down all the remainders of my tacks that you can see everywhere and get those smoothed out. We'll put it on the vehicle and uh, move on from there. Alternately, I could cut along these lines. I don't know if you can see that very clearly on camera, but I'm going to cut the bottoms of the bumper off just to give it a little bit more of a swept look. And then I'm going to add these end caps, which I'll need to bend appropriately. A huge thanks to my recent subscribers and those of you who have commented recently. The swing arm base has all been welded together now. I've welded that cap and blended it out so that I can add a little piece of tube on the end and my uh, latch plate. And on this side, I did a 27 degree uh, cut here and welded these two together and a three inch radius on that to or I guess three inch diameter, one and a half inch radius on that to match the, um, the diameter of my hub. I've got it sitting up on three eighths inch blocks and those are set against the magnets and the magnets are set against the back of the bumper, thereby keeping the swing arm perfectly even with the back of the bumper just where I want it positioned. So you can see that that has worked out reasonably well. I've got a little bit of a gap at the top here, but that is on purpose because I want actually to lift this end of the bumper up to three quarters of an inch while this end remains at three eighths of an inch above the top plate of the bumper when I actually weld this together uh, or at least tack it together. And the reason being is so that I've got a little bit of an angle on this swing arm so that when I weight it down with a tire and jerry cans or, jerry, or at least one jerry can, fuel can, uh, it will sit reasonably level. 
So that's the idea there. So again, I've uh, done a full weld, blended them out, and uh, this part is pretty well ready to go. So then the next thing to do is get the spare tire flange designed. Now I already had a quarter inch thick plate that I had plasma cut out to the correct bolt pattern for the Toyota. Uh, I keep a few of them on hand because Toyotas are fairly uh, common. Um, if you wanted to do this by hand, you certainly could, and I've shown that in a previous video, so I'll put a uh, link in the description of, the video, of this video so that you can have a look at uh, how that's done if you want to find center and do the correct bolt pattern. Um, but again, I just did this one on the computer. Um, but more importantly, what I've done is made some marks here to find out um, the dead center of this and where to put my, um, my gooseneck, which is going to support the spare tire flange. So in order to get my gooseneck nice and centered, what I did was make sure that when I uh, installed my bolts that I had the flat surfaces nice and in line with one another so I could lay a straight edge against them and draw a nice straight line. And from that I was able to measure down and figure out exactly where I needed to place, well in this case I measured down two inches and uh, did another line. Now that was worked out perfectly in this case with a six bolt pattern. I was able just to install two more bolts just loosely and place a, a straight edge against those as well. As you can see, I've done, draw a line there, find center across the, uh, the median, which I've done there, and then I can place my gooseneck in position. The other thing that's important to figure out is your back spacing, the space between the back of this uh, spare tire flange and the uh, back of the tire itself. Now that was six and one eighth inches. So that's why I've made a note here, six and one eighth to the short side of what is the, the top part of my gooseneck or the mast, uh, six and one eighth to the long side because it's a 45 degree cut on two inch material, it adds two inches. So here's that piece, six and one eighth to the short side, eight and one eighth to the long side. And then what I did is I took the uh, overall diameter of the tire that I tire and wheel combination that I wanted to eventually have on here and divided that by two. Now this is not that size, this is smaller. This is his stock spare tire. So I expect he might wanna go to a larger tire to match the tires that are on his vehicle. If that's the case, then we wanna allow for at least 34 inches. So half of 34 is 17. And then I've added an inch to that because Th this center line of this two inch piece is actually going to be the center point of the tire carrier. So that's why we want that extra inch. So this is 18 inches long. And when I place this in position, you can see that it sits just perfectly, almost bang on 90 degrees, not exactly. And my reason for that is the back spacing here, although I noted six and one eighth, was actually about, uh, let me think here. Um, was actually about six and a quarter. So I've given an eighth of an inch less room so that it will compress the tire against the mast when it's bolted up. So this edge here is ever so slightly lifted. So what I'm gonna do is tack my top two points and then I'll uh, remove the spare tire flange from the tire, clamp this down nice and tight, tack these points and then weld it fully. And then that way when I, um, install the spare tire onto the mast. Once the mast is welded to the uh, swing arm, then you'll have just a little bit of compression there, which uh, helps with vibration uh, or avoiding vibration and just gives a more uh, even stronger mount, more stable mount, I should say. I've also welded the handle into my cam style anti-rattle latch. And I've got the other parts of that all assembled here, including the latch plate. So we'll go ahead and install that onto the swing arm now and you can have a look at how that's done. Always nice to have a brand new lens protector installed on your welding helmet cause ones like that are real tough to see through. This is that 180 degree kind of fancy welding helmet that I bought ages ago. It's performing well and I'm really happy with it. These replacement lens covers are very expensive, so I kind of regret it in that regard, but maybe one of these days I'll do a proper review on this helmet. I do have some other footage already of it. But anyway, back to what we were talking about. Uh, I am ready now to hook up my latch plate to the swing arm, and I thought I'd just give you a quick overview of how that works before I do my welding. So again, I had already welded a one inch piece of one and three quarter inch tube to this uh, latch plate. And I've now installed the buffer, which is some UHMW that uh, slides along the top plate of the bumper. If uh, 
or sorry, once the latch is uh, clamped down, and also a rubber bumper that stops against the back side of the bumper so that there's no metal to metal contact when you're closing the swing arm and it's a nice soft closure. So if that will stay in place, it's only it's gonna sit there crooked, but that's the best I can do. This is my cam style uh, latch handle, which eventually these tabs here at the bottom will be welded to the base of the bumper. And then this will go over that one and three quarter inch tube. And that's what clamps it in place. Um, once that is in position, then I will find the center point of this here hole and I will mark it on the cam. And then that way, uh, that will allow me to place a T-handle, spring-loaded T-handle, through that hole, and that's what's going to hold the cam latch shut once it's up in position. So a little bit of an awkward way to display it to you now, but I just wanted to give you a quick view before I did the weld-up, and then we'll show it to you again. I've welded that now, or at least tacked it in place, just like I said I would. It's sitting exactly where I was hoping. Um, however, I forgot to mention that at the same time, I also needed to weld or tack weld the um, swing arm to the hub. Now, a couple of things there. Once this cap was secured um, nice and tight, I wanted it to be in a decent position, kind of in line with this. I think that looks nice. First, I was going to go, you know, um, straight across in line with the, the swing arm and the bumper itself. But then I kind of thought this might look a little cooler. So let me know in the comments if you agree. But anyway, the point that I wanted to make was now I've tacked the bottom here. I'm going to attempt to tack the inside. I think I can do that in position. And then I'm going to lift this side of the bumper up. So right now I've got a 3 8 inch block under there. Same on the other side. And that's so that when I tack welded this guy in place, it was, um, it's going to engage the bumper when the swing arm's dead flat. So when this is locked into position, everything will look perfectly true and dead flat. But like I said earlier, we have to put a little bit of an angle on this swing arm so that when we add weight to it, it will end up dead flat or very close to it. And then when we latch it, it will be dead flat. Um, so what I want to do is now replace this 3 8 inch block with a 3 quarter inch block right at the very, very end. That's what I've discovered is pretty much the right amount, um, you know, over about a five foot span uh, to give me the, the amount of sag that I need when we add approximately 75 to 100 pounds to the swing arm, which is what we're gonna potentially do. So I'll block this up and then I'll tack the top uh, after I've tacked that backside if I can get in there easily. There you are, I have removed the gooseneck from the spare tire. I have tacked the bottom side, and before I did that, I used an F-clamp to clamp it together thusly so that uh, it was nice and set at 90 degrees in both directions. As you can see, it is now. Perfect 90. So that's how you want that to be. And again, this needs to be an exact 90. If you're looking to, uh, to tilt your tire back, then you can do that here at the flange or at the mast, depending on the shape of your vehicle. Generally, it's done at the flange. Uh, in this case, we're setting it at a dead 90. Now that I've got my gooseneck ready to go, or my mast, if you want to call it that, it's time to set it in position left to right on the, uh, the swing arm itself. And this is the location that I have chosen for it. And here is my rationale behind that. The tires on this vehicle are pretty much exactly 33 inches in diameter. And I want to allow just a little more room than that in case the customer ever uh, increases the size of his tire. Uh, the tire that is going to be going in position initially is the uh, temporary spare that comes with the vehicle. So I believe it's only about a 30 inch diameter, maybe 31. I, I think it's more like 30. But anyway, the point is I was allowing for a 34 inch tire. Um, and so what I did was I measured out uh, the 34 inches for the tire diameter. I measured out eight inches for the width of my fuel can holder. We're only gonna be adding one now. The customers decided to go with one fuel can holder. Um, so I need to allow enough room in the, on the swing arm for the diameter of the tire, the fuel can holder, and a little space in between the fuel can holder and the tire. So again, what I did to find the mast position and also the fuel can holder position is I added my overall tire diameter, which in this case is going to be 34 inches for the, the uh, that's how much room I want to allow for at least. Uh, I added the 34 inches 
to eight inches for the fuel can holder and two inches of space between them just for a little bit of room there uh, and that of course comes out to 44 inches i subtracted that from the width of the tailgate not from the length of the uh, swing arm because the swing arm of course doesn't sit perfectly centered to the vehicle whereas the tailgate does so i came off the tailgate by simply using a square and drawing lines when i you know by coming back from the edges of the tailgate just like you can see there and then on this side because i didn't have a swing arm to intersect to at that point i just held my my square up against and measured out um, and i subtracted 44 inches from that dimension divided it in half and i came up with six and a quarter inches from each edge of the tailgate again not the swing arm i made marks at those points measured in eight inches for my uh, fuel can holder two inches of space for uh, a gap in between the holder and the tire and then the tire distance and split that in half and that is my mast position so you've got six and a quarter inches from the bend there 17 inches to the center of the um, spare tire mounting position another 17 inches to its edge two inches to the edge of the spare tire holder or sorry uh, fuel can holder um another eight inches to its other edge and then we've got six and a quarter inches of nice clear space for a person's hand to manipulate the handle so that should work out really well and although it doesn't put the tire centered to the vehicle it puts the entire assembly centered to the vehicle so it should look really good and uh, symmetrical more progress so i have put together the swing arm for the most part First, I added the mast, like I said, I just followed those lines and traced them back so that I had something to follow there. Used a magnet on each of these three points um, to, uh, to get my material flush with the backside of the swing arm. And then I just used a square, as you can see over there, to make sure this was square. Sometimes I'll use a magnet in both locations, um, but in this case, everything sat really, really nice and clean, so it really wasn't an issue. And I just double checked it after the first tack to make sure it hadn't pulled. None of them did, and they all lined up beautifully. So these are, um, oh, I forget now, but I think maybe 17 inches to this point here. Um, so I obviously cut the, uh, or sorry, the mast I think is 17 inches to that point there. So I cut these two, of course, to the same length. And then I went with the 34 inch span across here, which is the overall width of the eventual tire or close to. Uh, and then I spanned these 17 inch segments with uh, some more two by two tube, put a 45 degree on the end, capped it and blended it out and it looks nice and clean as you can see there. So now I'll just run some strips of flat bar down along here and, and uh, stitch weld it to the sides and that will be what supports my table for the back side of this where it will actually fold up this way. Fold up table, we'll accomplish that a little bit later. But for now, everything's in place. I'll remove these magnets and um, maybe we'll pop the swing arm back on the bumper, make sure everything looks good and clean. Uh, I've got to order my uh, fuel holder, fuel can holder um, pieces from my supplier. Uh, I have them on um, files on the computer, so I've got to get those plasma cut and formed for me. And then we'll put together a fuel can holder for it, add that as well. Um, and then of course, once this thing's mounted up on the vehicle, we'll look at that table location We'll cut those strips. I'll probably drill them out first for the brackets, mount them. And uh, we're getting very, very close to done with this job. I don't remember if I mentioned it in the last clip or not, but because I had this thing set up on my bench, which isn't perfectly flat. I mean, this has taken a lot of abuse over the, the year or so that I've had this particular top on it. And so it's not perfectly smooth. Um, but it's, it's good enough to get things started if, when I use uh, magnets in addition to make sure all my surfaces are flush, but I only tacked the back side here of the bottoms of these three tubes. And the reason was I didn't trust the bench to be completely flat um, in this direction. It's better this way than it is this way. This way it tapers down a little bit thanks to the wear on this edge. And so what that means is that it was gonna be likely that these wound up tilted back a little bit. And indeed that was the case. And that's why I have mounted the, the tire on here. I've turned it around backwards. That's why there's a big gap. Otherwise it'd be flush against these guys, but I wanted the weight to be as far out this way as I could reasonably get it. So I've added the tire on there. I just put one lug on there to make sure it doesn't fall off. And that gives enough weight to make sure that everything is pulled forward to the position it needs to be. And I can confirm that by using a straight edge along both surfaces and it's dead flat. So now I feel confident to uh, tack weld 
the fronts of all three of these, and then we can take the tire off and put this thing back on the vehicle and kind of work away from there. We still need to add our table and our high lift jack mount and our fuel can mount. And I've added a 45 degree gusset to the swing arm just to give it some more strength. I wouldn't have felt that this was necessary if not for the weld joint right here. I'll take these magnets off so you can get a better look. But because I've got a weld joint here, which I've blended out, uh, I want to make sure that I've got some extra reinforcement over that. And that's why I've put this 45 degree uh, support in there. That's going to tie everything together and make it super solid. Uh, we will weld all of this structure together before we weld this fully because uh, that's almost certainly going to tweak it just a little bit and we might have to make an adjustment there to make sure that the swing arm still closes exactly right. So always weld up your entire swing arm before you weld your hub. It's time to cap the ends of the bumper now. I've cut that angle in that I talked about which just gives it a little little nicer look and clears the tire away completely. It would never have contacted the tire, but just a kind of a, a nicer look, I think. And to accommodate that, of course, we're gonna have to put a bend in it. This is the template that I used for those caps. It already has a bend in it, um, but I found out that when, after I cut my steel version out, that that bend was just the tiniest bit too high for the actual bumper itself. So I drew a line just slightly lower and that's the one that I'm gonna actually bend on. Now I was gonna use my vice mounted brake. These are really handy. They just set into your average uh, bench vice using magnets and they work um, you know, up to, for very thin, sorry, I should say, for material that isn't very wide, you could go as thick as this, which is about 10 gauge, or this is 10 gauge. Um, you can go about that thick. Um, but if you're gonna go full length on it, you really can't go much above, I would say 14 gauge or maybe even 16. But it works great for thin stuff and for small projects. So for hobbyists, I do recommend these. In this case, it's not gonna work. Um, even though this is a narrow enough piece that it's got the, the force to bend it, it doesn't have the throat depth. So what I mean by that is if I try to drop this into the point where I get to that bend line, we're just hitting the bottom of the vise and I can't really go off to one side. It'll just, um, <clears throat> the uh, press brake will go all cockeyed and it really just won't work. So we're gonna use my homemade press brake over here. I just have a 20 ton shot press and on that I have uh, welded up some angle iron, three pieces of angle iron to create a nice V here and then I've got a solid piece of steel um, also in obviously the same configuration and just a, a tube to uh, center it onto the dowel there so that we can do some press work with this or some forming work with it. And I can do up to uh, just over 18 inches wide, I think 18 and a half inches wide. And this will bend um, quarter inch up to about eh, eight inches wide or anything under that for full length. And then I've also got another setup made exactly the same, made from one by uh, one angle rather than two by two. Uh, and this is a little more precise. You get a little crisper line with that. And so uh, I might use that this time. Um, yeah, let's use that this time. Still here after 28 minutes. You're awesome. A top-notch viewer in my opinion. One thing I should have mentioned is that with this uh, press brake down here, I don't only have this. I use this to make um, anchor flukes and things that are thin. Uh, I've got one that's about eight inches wide, and then I've got this one here, which is the full length. The reason I have three of them is just because when I'm doing narrower objects, it's easier to get everything aligned um, when you only have a top die. Uh, that's as long as it kind of needs to be, or as wide as it needs to be, I should say. That's all. So there's what we made in the press brake. Um, I just bent it to, uh, you know, I bent the degree to I. I, you know, I put it where I figured it needed to be. Um, and through experience, I've actually turned out a pretty close product there. It's not bang on. I got to adjust it slightly in the vise. Um, I'd rather open it up just a little bit in the vise than have to put it back in the press and uh, close the angle up a little more. So I'm happy with that. Um, if I did have to close that angle a bit more, it wouldn't be the end of the world. Just a little bit easier to toss it in the vise and open it up slightly. So I'll do that and we'll get that tacked in place and then we'll do the other side. Yeah, maybe I'll give you a view from the front here as well. So there you are. It'll be a nice looking cap when it's on there.
The weld up is complete for the base portion of the bumper up to and including the bottom of the spindle. As you can see, it's recessed slightly. I've done a pretty fat double weld bead around there and then just blend, or sanded it flat and blended the edge off. And that's pretty much it. I have double welded these uh, brackets in place. Otherwise, there's not a lot to show you here on the bottom side. So we'll flip it over, have a final look at it before we put it back on the vehicle. Check out all the welds and blends that have been done there. And then we'll uh, get it reinstalled and mess around with the swing arm. And right side up again. So it's pretty well finished. There are a couple of spots which I may grind out. I'm suspicious that there might be the tiniest bit of porosity lying underneath just a couple points. Very difficult to see, but there's just the tiniest pinhole right there that I might deal with. Otherwise, I'm pretty happy with it. The weld for the top plate here turned out nicely. And all the blends here went fairly well. Again, just a tiny pinhole right there that I might grind out later. But otherwise, the blending is done. And it turned out well. So we'll put this back onto the uh, shorter trolley that I use for doing installs with jack on it. And uh, away we go. Um, this is one area that I should actually focus on first. Um, I put the spindle in and uh, tacked it in place before I had finished blending this out, which was kind of regretful because of course it really limited my room in there and I wound up having to do all this with a die grinder with a flat wheel on it. Whereas if the spindle hadn't been in place, I could have more easily done it with a blending disc on um, an angle grinder or something like that. And likewise, this weld I had to do, uh, let me grab you a light so you can see a little better. And likewise, I uh, did this weld while the spindle was in place and it would have been easier if the spindle was not in place, but you can see it turned out well. So it just was a bit of a pain despattering and stuff in there. And then the spindle itself has been welded in with a double pass. So two weld beads exist there and two more on the bottom of the spindle. All right, let's leap ahead. I have done a ton of work without videoing it only because I was really running short on time and um, putting video to this stuff basically makes the job take two or three times longer, generally speaking. So um, if at least if I'm trying to do a decent job of it. So we'll do a little overview of the swing arm build. Uh, I think I might have included some footage already of the swing arm build. I had a quick look and I couldn't find any, but uh, I think I have done some. So hopefully this is just a continuation of the swing arm build rather than having to do an overview of all of it. But we'll have a little walk around session together at this point. There are a couple things that I still need to do, including um, adding the removable mud flaps, which I've got a note to myself there that I need two and a half to three inches of stick out this way towards the camera. And I want the mud flap to be positioned at more or less that point. Hopefully you can read that. Uh, so now it's gonna be easier to do this job with the bumper off the vehicle. Otherwise I can't really see how well lined up I am and stuff. So we'll, uh, we'll do it off the vehicle. I've recorded that point on both sides. I know my stick out, we're ready to go. I have of course created the swing arm itself, which has the tire carrier now with the proper tire on it. Up till this point, I've been using the spare but I swapped it out. I took the front passenger tire off, put the spare on there, and that tire is now on the swing arm. It's a little larger, a little heavier, so I wanted to make sure that the swing arm sat correctly with that much weight on it. I have tested it, of course, with the uh, jerry can holder in place. I haven't put a full jerry can in it, but I'm confident that even with that, we've got the right angle on this swing arm. We've got our table in place and our high lift, so the jack or the, the swing arm is fully weighted at this point, other than a full jerry can fuel can. Uh, we've got our um, radius plate installed and it's got two positions. This one holds the um, uh, swing arm open so that it's in line straight back from the vehicle and that's the most common position that will be used I would imagine um, when you're in a parking lot or if there's anything over on this side of the vehicle of course you don't want that swing arm to come open any more than necessary. So it gives him plenty of room to drop the tailgate in that 90 degree position, but he can't then open his fold up table. And that's why we've got a second position so that when he wants to use his fold up table or just have a little more room, this swings it open um, to, I would guess about 130 degree angle. I'll open that up for you so you can have a look. 
Uh, I have added a trailer wiring, uh, sorry, I should say a mount for the trailer wiring plug up underneath. The wire you can see dangling down right now is for the um, license plate light. That's going to be routed through the swing arm and into this position here. The license plate light will be mounted up into here and the license plate itself will be mounted here. And it swings closed over the bumper, but not below it. So there's no uh, departure angle issues there. I still need to blend out this one um, sanded uh, joint. I forgot to do that, so I just made myself a note there. Uh, what else can I show you? The latch worked out really well. Uh, initially, it was a bit loose, and I thought I might have to tighten it up or re-drill the hole in the latch to, to bring everything just that little bit tighter. Um, but as happens so often, once I throw all the welds into my swing arm, and especially at the hub here, everything kind of tweaks up a little bit and tightens up, and uh, we wound up with a really good fit on that latch. I just had to put a couple of washers in behind my little rubber bumper there uh, to act as facers, less than an eighth of an inch. Um, so really, really happy with the way that turned out. Very nice. Uh, I'll put you on a tripod now. We'll open up the swing arm, uh, have a look at the fold up table and so forth. And then we'll uh, put this thing on the hoist, take a quick peek at that trailer wiring plug and the underside of the bumper. And uh, then I'm gonna remove everything from the swing arm, remove the swing arm and then remove the bumper and we'll get some shackle mounts on it. We'll get those mud guards mounted and that's a wrap for this one. Everything can go to powder coat after that. Okay, so let's have a look at the underside of the bumper here. This is the bracket that I made for the um, seven way trailer wiring. Uh, it's just a couple of pieces of angle iron. Don't know how well you can see that. And then I've drilled those out to match the holes in the customer's um, plate that he already had for the stock bumper and then that way it just bolts up nicely, worked really well. Very simple and straightforward. This particular license plate light will just get snipped and um, capped. Those wires will get capped because they're not gonna be used. These will be snipped and extended and they'll run along and be zap strapped to these points here. And they'll go all the way through and up into the back side of the bumper there where uh, I showed you that um, the wiring goes through into the swing arm. So that's how we we root the uh, license plate wiring, pretty easy there. These are really handy little tabs to have for securing um, wire loom and other things with zap straps. I recommend them highly. I get these from TMR, my supplier in Ontario. So if you want them, they are available. All right, let's open up the uh, swing arm. So this is my cam style latch with a T-handle um, spring pin to secure it. Just opens up thusly. The uh, radius plate will lock into position automatically at 90 degrees, just like so. Now, right now, my table isn't secured down with its little T-handle that I made for it. Put that in just quickly so you can see how that one works. And this is only so that the table doesn't rattle around like this while you're driving. That could be pretty aggravating. So just give him a little T-handle so that he can secure that. And then, of course, it is absolutely and totally rattle free. So there's that. Again, I would have the, uh, the um, fuel can in place here. I just don't feel like installing it right now. You'll see it at the final install. Um, these are stainless steel marine grade hinges. Let's open the table up now. The table, if I remember correctly, is 32 inches wide by 10 inches deep. And it locks into position nicely like that. And two little tabs to drop it down again. <clears throat> it's got the high lift mount, high lift jack handle keeper on there to make sure that doesn't rattle. This is going to have a locking knob on it. I'll be getting a locking knob for this shortly to prevent theft of the uh, high lift. Um, the fuel can holder, of course, also has a padlock um, hasp on it or padlock tab on it, whatever you call it. Um, nice checker top plate on the bumper, two inch receiver with safety chain plate. We've got our uh, trailer wiring up underneath that I already showed you and uh, the swing arm can now swing now I should show you that the tailgate opens nicely in this 90 degree position but if he wants to open his tail table it will hit there again the reason that I don't have it uh, open further than this on its first stop is um, so that if he's got limited clearance on this side of the vehicle it's not going to swing open and smash into something so if he wants to open up his table he just leans forward lifts the spring pin allows it to drop into the next spot and he's good to go. Um, it can open up even wider than this. You can open 
spring pin one more time and allow it just to set against the side of the bumper if for any reason you needed to do that. But I imagine that's as wide as it will ever really need to be opened and that's why I put it in that position. And super straightforward to close again and totally rattle free. And it's done. Final fit up is complete and I only had to put the bumper back on just to check the alignment of the mud flaps that I've added there to make sure they sat nice and straight. I was a little worried that one of them was a bit crooked just looking at it on the stand, but my stand wasn't perfectly straight. Um, and it turns out that they look beautiful. Very happy with the way they turned out. They come right to the edge of the tread and they cover the entire tire, or entire tread, I should say. They look nice and clean and they are removable. So I just used a semi-truck uh, mud guard that was 24 inches by 24 inches and cut it down. Uh, these are each 12 by 14 inches now. And uh, again, they're removable. You can see the T-handle there, and that just uh, acts as a set screw to lock the, uh, the one inch tube that um, the mud flap is uh, hanging from into the one and a quarter inch tube that goes up to the support for the bumper. And you can see how I've lined all that up. It was a bit fussy to, uh, to get that all lined up nicely, perfect on both sides. Uh, and you can see here, I wound up coming back a little further than I originally intended in order to get my stick out correct. You can see the line on the top of the tube there, but it was more important to me that the stick out was correct and uh, therefore that the tire was covered correctly than, um, you know, it was where I had originally wanted it in terms of from front to rear on the vehicle. So very happy with that. It's totally symmetrical. This other side worked out exactly the same. Uh, I'll remove one of these so you can have a quick look at how that goes, which is really straightforward. And uh, this thing is done. I would, uh, or I should say I was tempted to uh, put the swing arm back on and assemble everything again just to get some good fil uh, footage of it. But to be honest, this project has gone on so long. It's just ridiculous and it's Sunday today. It's been a seven day week on this one to get it finished up and uh, I'm just beat. So I'm gonna just give you a quick run over of the, um, um, the mud guards and then we'll, or mud flaps, and then we'll uh, pull the bumper off again, send everything out for powder coating. One thing I will mention, this radius plate here, um, that was cut from an eight inch disc, which I have hanging around in stock. In fact, there's one sitting right there, uh, eight inch by quarter inch thick. And the reason I have those around is I use them for quick um, spare tire flanges. So I'll drill these out myself. I'll just find center on them and then I'll, um, then I'll add the appropriate bolt pattern to it and use them as uh, spare tire flanges, just like that one right there. Although that one has been plasma cut, but uh, those ones are for my kind of DIY style stuff, or if I want to do a quick one here in the shop, or if somebody wants to buy one uh, to set themselves. But anyway, I have these kicking around. So all I did was cut the, um, you know, the shape of the, the bumper out of that, set it in place, welded it up, gusseted it from underneath, and then swung my swing arm into the uh, positions where I wanted it to be with the T-handle in place. And with the, with the spring pressure dragging along the plate, I could see exactly where I wanted to, uh, to go with my holes. So I got dead center on the, the pin and then I made my two positions that I explained earlier. So that's how that whole thing worked out. And right now I've just got the spindle covered up with a piece of tube uh, that I use for when it goes to powder coat or when I'm working around it so that the spindle doesn't get damaged. Well, the big day has finally arrived and here she is all finished up and fully installed. Even the license plate light is wired and everything is good to go. Went together really well. Sometimes um, on installation, you find little interference issues and stuff if you've left hole tolerances too small or, or any tolerance too small. But uh, 
In this case, I had no issues at all, even though I left my tolerances tight, everything worked out well. Good examples of that are the, um, the holes here for the radius plate. Sometimes they'll shrink up with the powder coat to the point where the uh, pin won't quite engage. Um, similar is true of this one, um, but we had very good luck with this all around. So after it came back, all I had to do was obviously install everything, add a few plastic caps to the ends of some open tubes, uh, put my buffers and bumpers and all that kind of stuff back on, and uh, away we go. So as you can see right now, I've got the spare tire, or sorry, the uh, one of the wheels from the vehicle uh, mounted on the spare tire carrier rather than the actual spare tire, and that's just so the customer can get a look at that because it looks a lot nicer than it does with that ugly old spare on it, but uh, when he arrives, I'll I'll give him a walk around of everything and then we'll swap those tires out and he'll drive away with the actual spare on the back. But I figure it's time for a little walk around ourselves before he does arrive because I did kind of shortchange you in this video in terms of um, explaining some of the processes that I went through to create this thing, uh, especially the swing arm portion of it. So, we explain, or I explained the radius plate that that's um, actually a tire mounting flange um, similar to the one that this tire is mounted to and I just cut it to fit the bumper and gusseted it underneath. Uh, I put that in place before I drilled the holes. I just wanted to make sure that the radius was nice so the pin, when, uh, when I opened the swing arm, the pin radius matched the radius of the outside of this plate nicely. I did that, put the plate in place and then figured out where I wanted the holes because it's better just to have that plate nice and rigid before you start trying to figure out where your holes are going to be because those are very, very sensitive to, uh, to tolerances and they've worked out well. Uh, the cap on this TMR um, hub, I hope to have the writing in line with this piece here. Again, when you powder coat stuff, it, uh, it adds a few thousandths of an inch to everything. And so this is as tight as I can get it to go now. So it's a little off. So I wish that it wasn't, but that's the best I can do. I don't have a wrench large enough to go on here um, to really crank it down. And I'd be hesitant to do so anyway, because this is a, an aluminum cap that's been anodized. So it would mark up really easily. Here's our little LED license plate light. I've mounted the license plate to the swing arm and then I've got some, um, what do you call it, foam weather strip on the back sides to stop any scratching uh, against the swing arm and also against the bumper when it closes because of course the, the license plate opens up with the swing arm. Here's the fuel can holder that you didn't have a chance to see before. It's got my logo burned in it. My lighting isn't very good right now. Let's just change that. And there's a better look at that fuel can holder that I didn't have on last time. Customer can choose between a plastic or a, a metal uh, military style 20 liter or five gallon fuel can will fit in there comfortably. It has enough room um, width wise that when that can swells up thanks to the heat in the summertime, uh, it will still, um, it'll still work. It'll bow out nicely with the can and it won't break welds or anything like that. Our cam style rattle-free latch is in place with its little bumper there and its UHMW buffer right there so that no galling happens of steel, no metal and metal contact. Our high lift is in place. We've got the locking handle on there and a nice wing nut on the other end so he doesn't have to use any kind of tools to remove that. Our removable mud guards are in place. You can see our, well, it's pretty dark down there, but maybe you can see that T-handle that's been lubed up with uh, anti-seize so that we don't have um, issues with rust over time. And the powder coat worked out really well. I'm very happy with the, uh, the job that, that uh, my supplier has done for me as usual. It matches the lines of the vehicle quite nicely, I think. I hope the customer's gonna be happy with it. I'll uh, put you on a tripod now and we'll open up this uh, swing arm, have a look at the table and stuff one last time. And I think it's pretty well a wrap on this thing. Oh, actually, maybe I'll put it up on the hoist and show you the wiring on the back side of the bumper. All right, so one last time, let's open up this bumper, show you how the radius plate works, go over the cam style watch one more time and uh, get this thing on the road. So this is my anti-rattle cam style latch. Uh, it holds the bumper super nice and tight and has absolutely no rattle uh, to it at all. As you can see, super firm, uh, easy to open, put a little bit of pressure on the spring-loaded T-handle, smack the latch itself in to release that pressure and the spring or the T-handle will spring open. Thusly, pull this handle down, 
and you can open the, the uh, swing arm just as you see here. It will lock into place automatically, just like so. That's at 90 degrees to the bumper, uh, which gives you enough room to open up the tailgate, no problem at all. However, when I go to open up my, or to fold up my fold up table, and I take out the anti-rattle device here, I try to keep everything rattle free on my bumpers. So once I remove that, you will see that I cannot open the table in that position. But again, as I've said before in the video, the reason that I set it so that it opens initially at 90 degrees is so that it doesn't go any wider than necessary in case there's any obstacles like another car or something on the other side of that, you want it to stop uh, at 90 degrees. But we can't open that. So in that case, we just lift up our spring-loaded T-handle from here, allow the swing arm to open up to its next position where the table opens up really nicely. Um, I don't know if you can see that, the backside uh, hardware for the license plate and license plate light. Uh, there's a plastic plug right here. The reason is because I have a hole that I bring those wires through and then fish them through the uh, swing arm a lot more easily than I can through the small hole at the front there that the wires go through. So that's been plugged up nicely. We've got some wire loom on the backside of the swing arm here so that that wiring is nicely protected and looks nice and clean. And these are stainless steel marine grade hinges, uh, which have little catches under here. Super easy to operate. Lock that down into position. Put your anti-rattle device back in place, which is just a threaded T-handle. And you're good to go. Should the customer want to remove his high lift, he's got to use his keys to lock up this handle so that it won't just spin freely like it does now. That's an anti-theft device. We've got an anti-rattle device on the high lift itself so the handle doesn't jiggle around. And on this side, we've got a nice wing nut so that he doesn't need to use any tools to remove the high lift. To close this thing, we just lift the T-handle, pass the second notch, pull our spring-loaded T-handle, close the um, latch. You can see that the T-handle has not um, sunk in yet, and that's because I haven't given it the little smack that it needs to set everything into position, just like that. And then we are absolutely rattle-free and rock solid. So let's just have a little better look at these mudguard holders. Again, they're suspended from the brace that supports the, uh, the wing of the bumper or the side of the bumper. I just dropped a tube vertically down from there and then um, put a notch in it and welded another tube onto it. Um, the back spacing worked out best to keep it back this way. I set my T-handle, my set screw dead center, and this comes through, this tube comes through to about here. It's not all the way, um, but it's got about three and a half inches of um, purchase material in there. So if I unscrew this, you see how easily that comes out. <clears throat> in case when the customer's wheeling, he doesn't want to have rocks push the uh, mud flaps up into the exhaust when he's backing up or potentially even into the tire, although I think they're too short to actually contact the tire. But it's nice to have the option to remove your mud guards. So that's why I've given him the option. Okay, so just a final look at this wiring. There's where the uh, loom comes through from the swing arm. I've set up those nice little tabs all along here so that I can zap strap to them. We've got loom running all the way through. There's where it meets the stock loom. So this was the passenger side uh, license plate light. That's what I used, or license plate light wire, I should say. That's what I used to supply power to my license plate light. And up here, where you can see I've added another piece of loom in behind there, all I did was cut the ends, or cut the light off of the uh, driver's side license plate light, add some butt connectors to it, and then use shrink tube over top of those to seal them up completely, added loom over that, and strapped everything together so that it's corrosion free for the future, since we don't need those um, wires for this application. And I have added his seven way RV trailer plug underneath here for a nice high clearance approach. Um, rather than having it hanging down at 90 degrees, he's got a ton of clearance this way and he can just plug his wiring right up into it, as you can see there. So nice clean setup. And that is pretty well that. If you noticed in some of the other clips, this bolt wasn't tightened. <laughs> I forgot that, but it's done now. And that's it, waiting for the customer. And nearly an hour later, that's a wrap. 
Thank you so much for sticking with me. Your viewership is genuinely appreciated. If you have any comments, please do comment. If you haven't subscribed, of course I'd appreciate it if you do. And uh, we'll see you next time at Balmer's Workshop. We'll be getting back to the smaller vehicles after this. Toyotas, uh, although I do work on them occasionally, same with Nissans, uh, are not my mainstay. Generally, I stick to the really little vehicles, the Suzuki Sidekicks, the Vitaras, uh, the uh, Pajero, Pajero, Payero, however you say it, Minis, uh, and other small vehicles like that. So stay tuned for more of that action, but the occasional Toyota, Nissan, and other mid-sized vehicle as well. Thanks again for joining me here at Balmer's Workshop. We'll see you next time.